Welcome to Aussie Lawn Stars. While at VJ's event in Brisbane, I met Tate Crocker and I've followed up with him on the 12th of September for an interview. While Tate loves motorbikes, we also discussed his business with Jim's Mowing and the benefits he has found starting with the franchise. We covered many topics around equipment and business systems, catching versus mulching and scheduling software or CRMs, Paul Luck's approach to business and what size mower suits your customers best. Welcome to Aussie Lawn Stars, the fresh cut lawn care podcast. We've got Aussie legends and cowboys, seasons and grasses, and we're talking about unique equipment. Prepare to hear the real life tales of local stars. Plus, we have the latest equipment, reviews, and exciting interviews with the best suppliers. We will dig the fertile field of stories from part-time solo operators who are living the life, along with those of growth-focused entrepreneurs, identifying what makes a business successful. We really do cover it all. Boom. Welcome to the dungeon. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Let's get some dungeon lighting happening. (laughs) How are you? Yeah, going well, mate. How are yourself? Oh, yeah, I'm feeling a bit lonely since I saw you up at uh, Queensland at BJ's show. Really? Better, What's that? <laughs> better catch up with you again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was nice to meet everybody up there and see some faces, I guess, that have been around on the on the pages and different things. That was good, wasn't it? Yeah, really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's great fun. Yeah. Actually, uh, Dan, Dan said to say hello, Dan, the, the Mo Mentor. I was just chatting to him earlier. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, so you you keep up with him a bit. What's that, sorry? You keep up with Dan a little. Yeah, well, I met him. I met him there, and I just started messaging him back and forth, and he's always um, really helpful. So I'm just trying no, to get a bit good. of advice on different things, and obviously that's that's the name of his his Instagram. So that's what yep. he's doing, which is good. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah, so you're you're in that area, right? You work around that. Yeah, part of I'm. Things, right? I'm based in, uh, well, my region is Oxenford. At um, on the Gold Coast, so sort of just okay. where, pretty much where you'd see Warner Brothers Movie World is sort of my sort of area that I generally work around. I, I pretty much work from, I guess, around Gavin, which is a little bit further south, up until probably north and northern Gold Coast around Pimpermar, and pretty much each side of the highway from there. So up to Logan? <laughs> no, not not that far. Yeah, not that far. <laughs> Yeah, probably as, probably as far as it goes, Pimpermar, which is probably like, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes up, up the highway. Um, but the challenge is always the traffic on the Goldie at the moment. It's just so hectic and, yeah, you know, it's why I'm trying to get back closer to home and just, you know, get more density around where I live currently. Yeah, so if you're getting onto the Gold Coast Highway, that would just be bumper to bumper traffic at the wrong time yeah, of day. Yeah. yeah, especially like, you know, and the other thing is just the school traffic as well. Like you're going through suburbs at school traffic times and, yeah. Um, you know, even on a Friday afternoon after a trip run, it gets pretty hectic on the highways. Everybody's going down New South Wales for camping trips and different things and trying to get out of the out of the state. Yeah, trying to escape all the uh, Queenslanders. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Fair enough. Don't blame them. Yeah. <laughs> There's some good um, motorway parks just over the border too. Is there, yeah, like you mean sort of trail bike stuff or? Yeah, yeah, dirt bike parks. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I know on the way out to, where is it, around the, I want to way out to Burner out there. I think there's some sort of parks out that way. That sounds about um, right. Yeah, nice some friends around that area. Yeah, nice some friends that cruise out there and do that sort of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I've been looking at those going, oh, I need to get out there. I can't remember what the names of them are at the moment, but there's a couple of yeah. them there. Yeah. Yeah, I've yeah, got yeah. I've got the road bike. I've only got a I've got a Suzuki GS five hundred. It's my first bike. I got one when I was forty and I've you know, I've had the license for the last couple of years. I've got oh, yeah. my I'm unrestricted now, open and unrestricted. So yeah. it'll just be a matter of time before I get the bigger bike and get amongst it. But I mean, it's fun to put around in a nice, cheap bike to start with. And yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, it's still got plenty well for what it is. Uh, they're a good bike to get started. A lot of people go for that GS500. Yeah. Well, I picked it up pretty cheap. I got it for like, I think it was 1500 bucks. Nice. And a bloke had it sitting in his, in his, um, in his house. I think the previous owner had sort of dropped it real low speed and it had a bit of a, a bent selector shaft on the on the shifter oh, yeah. so i couldn't work out why sometimes it would struggle to go back into oh up the gear 
Uh, and then yeah. I found the bent selector shaft, and then I found a little bit of a bent, but it actually threw off the rear, um, the rear chain. So it, it what had happened is yeah. the chain had got so loose that the the chain actually flicked off, and then it jammed, yeah, and yeah. that's caused me to drop the bike. But uh, I got no. it for like eight hundred bucks, and then I I had previous mechanical background, so I just put a bit of money into it and got it fixed up and got it regoed, and yeah, nice. it's been a good little bike. Awesome, yeah, they they're a great bike, and that price, it's a bargain. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So, what style of bike do you think you'll head for next? Oh, look, it's sort of a at the moment it's it's kind of a fairly upright sort of naked bike. Um, I think I think I'd probably look at more of a cruiser. I like the Indian Scouts and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, they're pretty nice. That style of bike, um, but I do like I'm probably a little bit sportier with the naked sort of style I'm currently doing. But I don't know yeah. something about the, the cruisers. They look pretty sick. So. Yeah, no, they are good. I, I've had a cruiser. I had a Vulcan 900. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I picked it up real cheap. I picked up for two and a half grand and oh, looked at what other people were asking for them and they were asking around yeah. six grand. I had yeah, it yeah. for nine, ten months and sold it for four. So I yeah. did all right. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Made some cash of it and enjoyed it at the same time. Yeah. Awesome. When when I bought it, it was unregistered. I just put Reggio on it straight away and then put it up for sale and then yeah. rode it until it sold. <laughs> yeah, yeah, awesome. That's a good fun way to do things. And I, yeah. I'm not a fan of cruisers, so I was like, oh, I'll, I'll get that because it's cheap and you yeah, know, it gets me um, gets it out of the system and stick with the sport bikes from there on. <laughs> yeah, well, like I pretty much on the back or well, basically where I live, you go out pretty much straight up Mount Tambourine. So there's a oh, yeah. heap of beautiful spots out there and. Um, lots of different loops you can go around and, and um, some beautiful scenery too. So it's yeah, plenty of places to ride around here, so it's nice. Yeah, the Mount, Mount Tambourine's a really popular spot. I've heard a number of people refer to riding there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's some good loops you can go up and um, you can just do a big track all the way out and then come back around through different routes and lots of different scenery. And Numbar Valley is a good place to go as well. It's a beautiful place out there and yeah. you can go back to northern New South Wales from there as well. Yeah. Oh, well, you're a, you're a man after my own heart. Yeah, I think we <laughs> talk about the bikes too. I've heard that almost every show you talk about motorbikes. So, <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's it. And yeah. there's, there's a few people that message me, and they're like, oh, "Just get to the real talk. Stop talking about yeah. motorbikes." And it's like, "Okay, yeah. I'm just going to keep talking about them." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I had fun when I came up there and um, went to BJ's show. I brought my road bike up in the back of the van and yeah. went riding on that. It's great fun. Yeah, nice. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So you've done something else pretty smart, not just riding motorbikes, but you've gone into a gyms franchise, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I've just gone two years now. So 23rd of August was, was two years from my start yeah. date. And, um, yeah, second year in, which has been a bit more steadier even over this winter time compared to last year, which has been great. Um, yeah. I sort of, I came in when we had that hectic amount of um, La Nina and lots and lots of rain, <laughs> lots of flooding, and lots of cash flow issues, and all sorts of stuff. It was a really challenging time. More work than uh, you could keep up with. Yeah, I mean, heaps of work. Like, I think the biggest thing was you just taking bags and bags of green waste away. I couldn't believe the amount of grass I had to take away compared to what I'm doing now. Obviously, yeah. it's a lot dry. But you know, you you take away three or four bags of, of grass, and now you'd be lucky to take away a bag of grass in a normal size property. So, but working with robotic it. mowers, I've learned that. I've learned a lot about grass growth and I think traditionally yeah. in a normal season you expect to have about four millimetres of growth a day and what we were getting was up over 10 millimetres a day in that yeah. sort of yeah. running. Yeah. And, and then the challenge of actually getting onto the grass anyway is too, mostly too wet and too muddy. Yeah. And you just, so, you know, you get three or four days of solid rain and you couldn't couldn't go out there for another few days anyway. Were you running the um, Honda 216? Yeah. At the time I think I, I had the Bush Ranger at the time. Uh, yep. with the Honda engine, so oh, yeah. so yeah, that's what I was running at the time. So similar, pretty much a similar weight to the two one six, but um, yeah, but yeah, the two one six more recently. Okay, yep. So when you started, what made you decide to go to a gyms franchise? Well, I'd been in, uh, been in a corporate role previously. Uh, I was just looking for a way out in in some ways. I've been there for like eleven years, and um, I'd done sort of risk and compliance and IT work for a school and not for profit. Oh yeah. So 
really it was just looking for an avenue to get out. I've been there for 11 years and was looking at for other alternatives. And, and um, you know, I guess being at my age, I'm 42, got the mortgage, three kids and a wife. It was sort of something where I felt I needed a bit of, um, yeah, a bit of a brand behind me or, or something to get me up quick, smart to have a bit yeah. of, um, yeah. And especially because I think Jim's was putting the $1,500 a week kind of guarantee out there at the time too. It just gave me a bit of peace of mind. Yeah, I bet and, you haven't um, claimed that once. No, I haven't, definitely. Like <laughs> I, I reckon early on I definitely I could have at times, but it was sort of one of those things like it was just a challenge getting out there amongst the rain stuff initially. But um Yeah. But yeah, no, look, not something I I had to had to enact on anyway. So Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it's a good good thing that Jim offers that, but I think most of the time people don't need to claim it. No, look, I, I think it's pretty rare to be honest. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But um, but yeah, that was the main draw card. I think having a bit of security behind it, um, not knowing the industry. I mean, I'd, I'd done physical jobs previously and had was a re- apprentice mechanic and did some labour work in my younger years. And yeah, okay. um, I mean, the job's not you know you probably know yourself. It's not it's not rocket science. It is hard work and there's there's lots to learn. But um, you know, I think that peace of mind for me and learning some systems and having some external support is um, yeah. really helpful for me to get started for sure. So one one of the systems Jim throws at you right at the start is getting set up with all the gear. And did did you get set up with a ride on, or did you just go straight for the push mo whip snipper blower head jump? Yeah, well, I initially I went with all electric gear. I was trying to test that test the waters with that. I started yeah. off with all ego gear. I had the select cart. I had all you know all the general stuff, the blower, um, yeah. the multi tool, and the and the bits and bobs of that. Yep. Um, I sort of realised. You know, with especially that growth weight we had at that time, I really needed something for the solid kind of growth we had at the time. So uh, petrol which was, engine, yeah, you know, stuff was great for the for the maintain stuff. But when you yeah. really had to get into some really heavy stuff, you, the two you know, couldn't go past the the Honda engine on the um on the Bush Ranger at the time. So yeah, probably I started in. I guess it must have just been the end of tail end of winter. Yep. Um, and so everything wasn't that hectic at the time, but um. But yeah, definitely got that that state where I needed something with more power. But um, I mean, I've pretty much used the EA gear up until this point. I still have the select cut and that in there as well. Not that I I don't generally use that as much these days, but um, yeah, okay, but yeah, that's what I kind of started with. I've got the uh, thirty two skag now as well. The so, standard. Yeah, the standard. So I picked that up um, probably or oh, maybe maybe only three months ago. So yeah, okay. yeah that's been, had it for a while. So it's a good little addition to the to the tools. So three months ago, you'd be still getting used to it. Yeah, look, I've done. I've I've only done 30, 30 hours on it currently. Um, my biggest challenge is just working out um, transportation because, okay, you know, it's working out how to get it into the thing. I still do a fair bit of gardening work, so I'm just trying to nut that all out to work out the best sort of avenue for it. You know, because I sort of went from yeah. only doing a tip run once a week to having to work my jobs around the skag and the green waste. Yep. Um, I don't have a separate kind of um, compartment to put it in the side or anything. I've got a double box, but you know, I, need, I have the two mowers in there currently, and I have to do some mods to put that in there. And then I wouldn't have yeah. a, a push mower. So, see, so yeah, that's the little th- sort of thing I'm working at the moment. And I think some of that's just a matter of time to to weed out some of the other jobs and have more standard work, and then also, yeah. um, I guess maybe route my days a bit differently. So I get do gardening on certain days, and then just mower and skag sort of work um yeah on the sounds, sounds like you almost need to get rid of that mower box on the front so you can do a box that's got the skag and and your honda yeah on it. yeah yeah it's a challenge because like then you've got to consider your tow ball weight and different things as well yep um and so i am thinking about the truck sort of set up possibly um yeah okay. again that's more money <laughs> is your is trailer that? tandem axle yeah it is dual axle yeah so dual yeah. axle double box in the front um yeah it's a nice trailer yeah beautiful trailer um yeah yeah the worst thing was is when i first got it i probably could have put a pad on the very front of it but because of the i guess the challenge of accessing properties in some of these places here i'd end up parking over two driveways so, <laughs> yeah. I, had, so I had the um what is it the sorry at the front of the trailer i had the, the a-frame the, yeah the a-frame kind of reduced it you know just yeah. pulled in a little bit so i could so i could do that and then in hindsight probably needed it to put the pad on and it wouldn't have got me out of the drama, but anyway, it is what it is. So yeah. it's got to work well, that's the best I can. Yeah, and you, you can still work these things out as you go. It might be uh, yeah, 
might be worth your while to sell that trailer and get a new one so you can organize your tools and get your keep yeah your it might away. be it might be the go like I, I um that's the thing i was going back and forth with um dan about is just sort of you know how, how to set it up and sort of struggling with this you know just a few ideas and i think what i'll probably do is you'll just focus gardening on a couple of days of the week and then have three days where i can carry that without taking the green waste and yeah to work out a longer term plan around that as well yeah that's it and he loves his trucks too, so he might yeah yeah he might yeah. push you that direction. He's all set up with the Isuzu, and and he's yeah. all pretty um, compact with what he's got there and efficient. So yeah, those small Isuzus are a pretty neat option for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely something I I would like to consider in future. I just it's just the financial aspect of going out and buying a new truck again. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. I think um, if you. Look at your turnover for a financial year and then work out how much of that turnover is going to be yeah. consumed swapping vehicles. So if you sell yeah. your ute and then buy a truck, how much out of pocket will you be? Yeah, we're sort of, we've got to upgrade the family car at some point too. So that might become, <laughs> you know, the one that goes, the Hilux goes into the family car and then we get, we get the truck from there and yeah, that might be a better option. And then to keep it under the business still, which is always handy, a bit of tax deduction. That's right. And write off some tax to the for the fuel costs and different things. So, yeah. so yeah, that's a good way to do it. Yep, definitely. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, over the first couple of years with the gyms franchise, you you would have learnt a few systems. But we we talked about sort of the system they've got for getting you set up with the right tools right off the bat. Yeah. What are what's some of their systems that really stand out to you that have helped you get started? <laughs> I think probably the the. The, definitely the strengths of the gym system is, um, you know, I guess the feeding of the leads. That's that's definitely the biggest thing. The, yeah, there's a lot of recognition with the brand and a lot of respect with the brand. I mean, people, you know, there's so many jobs that come through that were on service, especially in my first year. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Um, you've got a huge source of leads coming through, and that's probably the greatest asset of the brand. And, and I guess being associated with the gym's brand, people generally um, – you know they trust it and they know it they see it around everywhere yeah. so we you know we generally do probably have higher pricing but at the same time we also pray um you know also have have franchise fees so yeah um we've probably got some higher operating costs and different things in that regard so um and also yeah the support network of crew um but i think also like lmca is pretty solid in that in that regard too like there's a lot yeah. of information that you pick up off there that you know it's pretty similar yeah. Um, I guess you have somebody you can pick up the phone and, and have a chat to your franchise or if you've got an issue about something you want some direction or something as well. So yeah, that's definitely handy to have. And then and then the software, um, I guess you can also get uh, very granular about what sort of work you want to have and where you want to have it as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you can so you can say, oh, I want just my regular jobs or I want once off gardening or I want gardening regular. Um, yep. you know, go to cleanse all sorts of stuff. So you have a fair bit of granularity, yeah. which maybe you wouldn't get, um, you know, if you're running independent, it couldn't be that, that, um, granular with it. But I mean, there's definitely yeah. pros and cons to, to both sides of it. And, um, yeah, you know, but I, in, in my case, the advantages seem like the, the best way to go at the time. Yeah. And I, I hear that with any gyms franchise that I speak to when I do an interview with people like you, mm. I'd. I don't hear people going, no, nah, I wish I'd never done it. I Generally speaking, people are going, you know what, that's worked really well for me. And there's been two or three guys that have left the gyms franchise after they've done it for a couple of years and you're like, okay, I don't yeah. need it anymore. I can get where yeah. I need to go. But gyms, they, they still say gyms really help them to get started and get heading in the right direction. First. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And, and you know, I mean, I know guides that have moved on as well, and it's one of those things. Once you sort of learn the ropes and different things, I think where I think where gyms is really, really good is if you if you are managing a lot of team members and yeah. you wanted to source that work, that's where it makes a lot of sense because you're paying the same fee regardless if you're you're a solo operator or you've got 10, 20 guys on. So yeah, you know, I guess where that's where the major benefit is is if if you've got a big crew and you can feed all that work in. Um, it makes a lot of sense. Um, whereas if you're a solo guy and you've, you're established for a while, at some point it might might be viable, it might not be. So, yeah. Um, and I, you know, as a solo sort of guy, that's um, you know, just something I'll play out over time and see where, where it leads to. But yeah, happy with what I'm doing at the moment. So, 
Yeah, so you're not um, you're not pushing at the bit trying to grow your business and put on t- employees. No, no. Yeah. <laughs> we got lost balance. <laughs> well, that that's everybody's different there, isn't it? It's just, yeah. No, you don't need to say this is a sign of my manlyhood or this is a sign of yeah. my respect to be able to grow a big business. It's like no, yeah. you've, you're in this because you can choose what works well for you. Yeah, totally. And look, I yeah, you know, I was in a position before where I was in a pretty high high pressure environment and it was hectic all the time and you're doing all these additional hours and you weren't, you know, essentially you did that because that's just what you did. Yeah. Um because you had to. Um but the fact now that I can choose what I want to do and have a bit of a flexibility in my life and, you know, decide how hard I want to go. Um but at the end of the day I really I really just wanted the flexibility and and yeah. to be able to decide when and what I do and how I do it. So yeah, I think that's yeah. the best thing about owning your own business is just having that having that flexibility. And at the end of the day, you make the call, and there's nobody going to tell you otherwise. And if it doesn't succeed, well, you've only got yourself to blame, I guess. Yeah. Well, I think when you go in with a gym's franchise, you've got all of the backing of the gym's franchise. You've got your franchise or that can help you when you need help. Um, yeah. And if you're not in a gym's franchise these days, with the backing of LMCA and the yeah, Facebook yeah. groups that you can go to for support. Yeah, then, I think the biggest thing is is probably like also as well is you have, I guess you have a bit of a price guide and and it's yeah that's probably the biggest thing for for new operators is just trying to work out you know what what do I charge how do I charge it yeah um you know how long does it take I think that's the biggest thing of starting fresh in this industry is just like you've got no no benchmark as to yeah. running a business like it's very different doing the job as opposed to running the business aspect is just so super different. Yep. And, um, you know, you can talk about top line revenue in your business and say, I'll make this a week, but, yeah. you know, and it might be comparative to what you used to make maybe, but you don't have holidays, you don't have super, yeah. you don't pay tax, you know, or your tax is always, you get that fortnightly pay when you're in a job. Yeah. Um, that's all after those things. So, yep. you know, it's really important to to focus on running the business. And, and, and for me in particular, I, I've sort of learned that, you know, it, in the hard way in, in some ways because cash flow becomes an issue and the bills come in, the bads comes in yep. um, and you've really got to adjust um, your, your thought process around running a business as opposed to just, you know, doing a job each week and yeah. trying to kick it over. Yeah, well, I, I spend a lot of time talking about making sure you understand what the numbers mean and knowing what yep. your numbers are so that you really do get a good grasp of what you need out of your business. But yep. I've been in it for 13 years and I still – get challenged by the um, bass when it comes through. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm yeah. putting money aside. So I, I know that I'm putting the right amount of money aside, but I go back to my accountant every now and then. I'm like, what's going on here? I've put all this money aside and that's all gone and I am still owe a tax bill. What's going on? <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. I, I sort of found until recently, I was like, man, I need to have some financial systems. I mean, that was always what I did with my pre- previous work was like system analysis, putting the systems in place, putting procedures in place. Yep. And I was like, I'm, I'm just like, I don't even know what I'm doing here. I've got had one income account and a GST account. And then for me, it was like, oh, yeah, there's money there that week. I'll buy this. Or, yeah, and yeah. then the bill comes in and then the bads comes in and then tax comes in. Yep. So I was like, I really need to to work out how to run this business and, um, you know, from a financial perspective because the work's there, the income's yeah. there. But I think you can still have a very um, financially viable business and just run it into the ground, basically, if you don't put yeah. good financial systems in place. Yeah, definitely. It's pretty easy to do the wrong thing. And yeah, I, definitely. I, I'm a big, big advocate for having several bank accounts. So you're saying you've got two bank accounts for it. I'll, yeah, I've got yeah, well, four. Yeah. Yeah, well, I just started a thing called Profit First for Tradies. Um, yeah, that's great. Basically, yeah, really good book. Actually, I, I saw it on the LMCA group. Somebody mentioned it. I yeah. think you might remember Chris Neal, Mates Rates Mowing. Yeah, He was around for a while in LMCA. And, and I guess the sad story of that was he was a guy that was super, super passionate and he ended up having to fold the business um, yeah. over time. And, and I just, when I was searching through about some stuff, his, his post popped up saying he was shutting down. Yeah, and um, I read through the comments, and I thought this is really sad. Like this guy was super passionate about it, and unfortunately, you know, his business um, financial for financial reasons had to had to finish up. And somebody yeah. mentioned first for tradies in the in the um, thing, and I got the audio book, went and did the course, and I started to put it in place. So basically, 
Um, I have like a, an income account, operating expenses account, a GST, tax, and an owner's pay account. Yep. And every Monday, everything that's in my income account, I just distribute by percentages. So I've work, yeah. worked out sort of my operating costs and how that, that works. So each week I know money's allocated aside, so all those costs are kind of managed. I mean, I've only been doing that for a month, but I can say, you know, honestly that it's just changed my business so much just by doing that basic kind of percentages each week and knowing the money's there. And it also... Like I said before, if you have one pooled account, you just think you're sweet because you're like, oh, yeah. there's money there. Yeah. Um, but, but you didn't know where the expenses were allocated because it just looked like there's this, this is one single amount. Sweet, I'll go and yep. buy a new tool or go to Bunnings or I'll get some KFC or... Yeah, that's it. <laughs> you know, before you know it, the BAS bill comes in, the tax bill comes in, you're like, oh, we'll even week to week. So yeah. um, but on paper, you're profiting. You know, you, you, you've you got a profitable business, but, you know, the, the cash flow is not there. So... Um, that's definitely a big thing that's improved over the last sort of sort of month, and and it looks like you know it's going to be a really good system for me moving forward. Yeah, I think cash flow is a um, that's a concept which most people haven't given any thought to until they start looking to get a home loan or whether they yeah. can sell their business or various different things like that, and all of a sudden you're like, okay, go and talk to an accountant or talk to a bank manager, and they're like, well, what's your cash flow look like? And you're like, yeah, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Well, that's it. I mean, for me, for me, although I was making good income, it was like I was still living week to week, you know. Yeah. And um, just because of the poor, poor financial management, not not because the money wasn't there. Like the money was there, I just wasn't managing it very well. So. Yep. Um, yeah, it's definitely helped me in practically in a lot of so ways. So. Monitoring cash flow really changes from living week to week to planning. Yeah. A period of time in advance, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, like You're I just found. Is there, well, a, you're right, sorry. You're is there a good way to explain to other people what it means to understand cash flow and to be able to plan your business around cash flow? Mm. Well, I think I think as well, like if you come from a, a mentality where you're an employee previously, you, you sort of you just trust that all those things like super and your annual leave and sick leave and you know your holidays and that are all covered. Whereas you know in a business, you've got to manage your cash in a way that you can put that away. And that also, um, I guess you can take, I guess you can take the buffer out of cash flow with managing your money better. As I said, if you've got that system in place, you know that each each week the money comes in, it gets allocated to what's, what's required. And then when you get to next week, hopefully there's a buffer if you have an off week. Because the because you know you go through a really good season in summer and you'll go oh yeah sweet I'll go and buy tools I'll go and buy this I'll go and buy that and then you get to winter where it slows down a bit possibly and then you're like oh you're living week to week you know it's yeah it's definitely um, you know something that you you need to have on the back of your mind all the time and you know if the yep. cash isn't coming in especially if you've got thirty day accounts and different things where that happens or DVAs or um, you know dealing with NDIS like the payments can take quite a bit so yeah. Certainly, really yeah. important to have it in. I've have it listened in. to a few people over the years where they've said that they've got ahead by putting ten dollars a week aside to pay their phone bill or their electricity bill. Yeah. It's like okay, they they can see that putting a little bit of money aside means that yeah. they don't get hit by a big bill. And previously, I've always looked at that and gone, you know what, you're just not good with your money, and that's why you need to do that in order to not yeah. get hit with a big bill mm. but running a business yeah that is the best way to do it because you put that money aside week by week and that means that your cash flow is spread out more evenly yeah because you're putting your money aside for your expenses as you go so yeah that if you put put a little bit of money aside for an equipment fund or for the bass statements or your tax then mm -hmm. when you look at your bank account, you can say, okay, my operating bank account yeah. has a consistent amount of money in there regularly because I'm pulling money out of there for tax. I'm pulling money out of there for new equipment. I'm pulling money out of there for yeah. own, owner drawings. And that means with your cash flow that from week to week, month to month, your cash flow is going to look fairly consistent. 
Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. It, it, again, it's like that buffer. You know, if, if in the good times you've got that money allocated and it's in its correct place, when you have those times that are challenging or you injure yourself or something happens like that or you want to take a holiday, you know, you've got to have that. Otherwise, you just find yourself, you know, chasing after that that dangling carrot, you know, and not getting anywhere, unfortunately. And that's kind of where I was at. So, yeah. I was like, man, I've got to change this. I've got to work out how this is, um, how to get this sorted. So, yeah. So, what, what that looks also, like. Also, by having it separated too, you can work out what areas aren't working. I think the biggest yes. challenge too is, it, is that, you know, I think even based on the conversation that the LMS or um, Skull Sessions had previously about Paul and, you know, operating costs and different things, they can just eat up your whole business, you know. Yeah. I mean, for me, I've got a big loan, I've got, you know, a mortgage, I've got, you know, you got a car loan. You add you, if you add a truck to that, or some equipment, or a Skag finance, and you know, you've got to be really wise about what decisions you make for your business. And it's not that we don't want to have great equipment, um, but it's just that the business can fall over if you don't if you're not wise at what you do. Um, they're definitely all tax deductions. Yes, but you know, you've got to make decisions that actually, you know, hopefully bring money to the table in your business, other than just look good or, or a good thing to have or, or make yeah. you feel better in yourself too. And, and, I, and I want all those things, like I want the flash truck and I want all that. And I've probably got some good gear compared to some guys as well. But, yeah, you know, even for me, I, you know, I've got to be conscious of what my operating expenses are now and not get myself too deep, um, you know, because I just don't want to work harder. <laughs> I want to work more efficiently. And I think that's probably what Paul was talking about is that, you know, you can run a really efficient business on real basic stuff close to home and run it really yeah. um, on the smell of an oily rag and still do very well profitably. Or, or you can go big and you know massive and then not run as efficient. So, I mean, there's two, definitely two sides to that story and people want different things and there's nothing wrong with either way for sure. But um, yeah, you just got to make your own decisions based on your own business and how you want to run it for sure. I, I get asked occasionally about making decisions like that and yeah. typically speaking, I push back a little bit when somebody comes along and says, oh, do you reckon I should buy a ride-on mower or do you reckon I should buy a skag? And yeah. I'm like, okay, how, what percentage of your jobs will you do with that new mower? Yeah. And if the answer is that you're going to try and build a yes. business around that new equipment, then yeah. maybe hold off and don't rush out and buy it. Yeah. If you've got customers already where you can get that Skag 32-inch out and do, say, 70% of your existing work with it, mm. then it's a much better business case to say that's worth doing. But mm. a lot of people fall into that trap of going, okay, I want to go out and buy a 32-inch Skag. Oh, and I want to buy a 60-inch. And then I want to buy yeah. this and that and the other. And yeah. if your business turnover is $20,000, where's the money going to come from? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. If you've got yeah. three employees on and a lot of big contracts, then you need that equipment. And it's pretty obvious when you've got the turnover to support it that that's what you need to do. Yeah, no, that's right. And it's all in timing. It's sort of a hard one with, with the, you know, sometimes you might have to purchase a bit of equipment and then, and then try to work and build your business around that. But yeah. like you said, it's going to make financial sense. And and one thing when I bought the, the ZT, it was like, okay, what, how, how am I going to pay for it? How's this thing going to pay for itself at the end of the day? You know, because that was my first thing. It's like, if I'm going to spend this amount of money and this, you know, $100 is going to go out each week on expenses for the finance, you know, is that that's one lawn a week or two lawns a week, maybe if, if you know, um, you know, it needs to make at least that back and hopefully make my life easier. And definitely, yeah. definitely, you can see that working in an environment where you've got, you know, good access in those properties still because even even though it's a small machine you still got to make sure that those properties are suitable for that and you're going to get the best out of it you know yeah and, and that's the thing for me like i guess the challenge that i've found has been transporting equipment you know and it's at the end of the day you want it to be more make you more efficient so you need to consider that as well and in, in the way that you you know you work yeah. around your business too i mean i definitely love using it and i know that i'm going to start to to work towards jobs that are very suitable for that and and I think as well, sometimes you do need to purchase equipment and then work your business around it. It's sort of, yeah, it doesn't magically happen unless, you know, unless you're in a place where you're probably doing thousand square blocks all day. Um, anyway, that that's probably a really easy business decision. Um, yes, definitely. 
that up here we're sort of finding a lot of our properties are sort of you know below 400 square and and sometimes that just wouldn't be suitable for access in certain areas even though you could get access it's not always going to be yeah. it, it might be more efficient just to use your pushy for some of those and and um yeah you just got to got to work in your business to see how, yeah. how it goes if you're doing a lot of thousand square meter blocks then i would suggest going up bigger than a 32 inch heading yeah. for a 42 yeah, that's it. I mean, I think I think realistically, probably your range is like five hundred to to a thousand is probably a good range for that size machine. I mean, yeah, I, definitely. I think um, you know, I just I just did a couple of places. I did a I was at a a two and a half acre place and and a yeah. one point eight acre place the other week. And although yeah. this guy did an awesome job, I was like, man, you could really use a fifty two in this scenario. <laughs> yeah, it's smashed out pretty quick, but yeah. um, it's got a fair bit of pace and it'll do it. Um, but you I've, know, I've when, had. I've had forty-two inch machines for most of my, or for all of my business actually. Yeah, and they're great for sort of six hundred square meters through to one one and a half acres, maybe. Yeah, but um, once you're going over one acre with a forty-two inch machine, you start going, "Oh, a fifty-two would be awesome, yeah, or a sixty yeah. inch would be awesome." And yeah. yeah, it really is a case of going, "Okay, what? Where's the bulk of your work?" And yeah. For me, for a lot of period of my business, I would target the kind of work that was suitable for the 42-inch machine. And yeah. then once I started picking up larger acreages, I started going, okay, I need to think about a 56 yeah. or a 60-inch machine. Yeah. Yeah, and that'll be the same with me. Like, it's just going to be a matter of time of furthering out that smaller stuff. And, um, I mean, that's the biggest thing. And, you know, you, you can just sort of find yourself taking on any sort of work that comes through. And not yeah. be very targeted about what you take on, and and that's probably where I'm at at the moment with my business. It's like, okay, where do I really want to go in the next next twelve months? Where's my sort of vision for the business, and what kind of properties do I want to do? Because you know, like there's there's always work out there, and there's always um, opportunities. But you know, sometimes it's just a matter of saying, what do I really want to do, and what how do, you know, because you want to enjoy what you're doing every day. Um, you know, I, I know for me, even just just recently, I've got a I've got a DBA customer that i took on you're like okay yeah i can get some okay money for that job but i'm like i gotta walk into a complex it's not a very nice lawn <laughs> you know the customer's probably not that appreciative um but then you go to a you know a place that's half an acre and they've got beautiful hedges and the beautiful lawns and you're like well this is kind of what i want to do you know um, yeah because you can just sort of take anything and not be very targeted at what you do um and you want to definitely enjoy and and take pride in what you're doing as well yeah, well, I think it's worth looking at what you want to do and what's readily available in your area, which yeah. going back to Paul Luck, that's one of the things he was focused on was doing yeah. jobs which he could do with the um, low barrier to entry, so the jobs that where he wasn't having massive business expenses. Yeah, yeah. And then um, on the opposite end of the spectrum, you can go, okay, I want to only do jobs where they're um you know i'm spending a day a week or five days a week on one site yeah but your operating expenses are going to be a lot higher when you're doing larger jobs like that yeah definitely yeah i mean for me it's like i mean my biggest thing at the moment is just like with the green waste aspect i'm, I'm thinking that where do i want to go moving forward with the green waste you know i, I don't even know if i really want to focus on that kind of work because i find that super inefficient you know first of all i can't take the equipment that i want to take um and yeah i've got the work and that's making me income but this is where i kind of want to be you just find yourself stuck doing that um, yeah and then and then when you go under the tip run you got to pay for tip fees and all those other things so yep. you know we've just got a heap of new uh, customers or heap of customers are probably up this end of the coast they've got like green bins as part of the council so that opens another yeah. avenue you know i think that's probably where i'm moving in the future is just to minimize what i'm taking away because not only you're loading up the truck, you're spending more time stuck in traffic going to the tip and, and then paying yep. the tipping fees. And, and then, then if you've got to get the skag in, you've got to do a, another tip run to get the skag in that day. And, you know, so. Would that's you be able to put the, would you be able to put all of the green waste from one job into a green bin? I had a couple of, yeah, look, it depends where you, I guess it depends what job and where you're going. I mean, I was yeah. just talking down with this Asavo. It's like I've got some places where they've got golden palms and you just well, you can take <laughs> half a trailer of golden palms away. Yep. And um, you, you, you wouldn't even get sort of half of that put into a green bin if you were lucky. So, yeah. Um, again, I think it's been targeted about what you want and probably figuring out the customers that don't work for your business and being a bit more strategic about the direction you're taking because, like yeah. I said, it, you, 
I kind of feel like where I'm at is I've just taken work on that came in, you know, and I haven't yeah. been very focused on what I want to do. And, and now it's just that next season for me is just to try to work out where I'm going and, and what I want to focus on. And th- this is why I built my business around mulching rather than catching. Yeah. And, you know, it's not going to work for every customer, but mm. I've specifically targeted customers where I know I can mulch instead of catch. Yeah. And I, over the 13 years, there's been cases where I've gone, okay, there's customers I've got which there's no way around it. They want it ca- caught or I need to catch it to make it worthwhile. But yeah. um, I have either filtered those customers out or kept them to a minimum. So the majority of my customers I do with the mulch plug-in. Yeah. And um, and tailored my business accordingly, which reduces green waste down and the properties I've done with the catcher on have been able to take the green waste on their own property, either through their green bin yeah. or through having yeah. a dump place on the site. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. Like I think, again, with the filtering out of the customers, you you would just probably focus on customers that have green bins. And uh, I know some people have just said if they don't have a green bin, it's mulched. If you don't want that, that's that's okay. <laughs> but and that I, doesn't I get, work for yeah. everyone. Yeah, look, I get that totally. And and you know, I I definitely understand also that if you're gonna if you're gonna be catch, you're probably gonna get a premium, you know, kind of service. Like yeah. it does look really nice, and sometimes. Um, there's there is a bit of a compromise on on mulching in some cases, definitely. Yeah, so definitely. I, I get both sides of the argument. Not to yeah. get down the mulching and caching thing. <laughs> <laughs> but the the alternative there is you could go all right. I really want to build my business around mulching. Yeah. But in order to make the catching worthwhile, I'm going to charge a premium on the catching rather yeah, than doing yeah. the mulching. Yeah. And that way you go, okay, if I charge a premium for catching, I'll reduce my jobs down to six jobs a day instead of eight or ten jobs a day and make yeah. sure that I'm charging enough for the catching to take the green waste away so that it, I'm still making the same amount of money. Yeah, totally. And I guess that's a justification too. Like I've, I had I had a job today where I was probably there for an hour and a quarter. I think I charged 100 and I think it was 158 and did a mow, did a heap of, uh, you know, golden palm frond cleanups. Yep. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, I made I made that an hour and 15. It's like, well, but I took all this green waste and now I have to take that up, up to the tip. And I'm like, if I just did two lawns and they had a green bin, I made the same money and then I've reduced my expenses and I haven't had to go to the tip, you know? Yeah. So it, it is. It's one of those things of working out what suits. And, and um, I think, I think again, it really comes down to the top of property because, you know, you've got those certain properties that they've just got banana trees everywhere. They've got birds of paradise everywhere. <laughs> yep. you know, everything just drops palm fronds every summer and it's just a mess and they can just be never-ending nightmares. I mean, you know what it's like. And and then you can have some gardens that are well-maintained. You can, you know, they get a couple of things, drop every now and again. You do a bit of hedging and, and you know, you can put that stuff in the green bin. So. It is, again, yeah. just a matter of focusing on what kind of work you want to do. And, and look, in saying that too, I mean, doing those once-off jobs in wintertime, that might be really suitable where you do that and um, go and do a big clean-out and that sort of thing. But yeah, when things are cranking you along and you want to, you've want you got plenty of work on, you don't want to necessarily muck around with that stuff because it just hinders you in doing other things. Yeah, that's right. And you, you really get that push and pull sometimes between what you want to be doing and what the customer wants you to do. Yeah. Yes. And, yeah. And that's it. And it's sort of one of those things of like, you know, doing your business on your own terms as opposed to it's necessarily like, I guess the old thing about the customer is always right. It's like, yeah, okay, I get that. But you're also running your own business and you're running yeah. your business on your own terms. And at the end of the day, if that, that, w- that will suit some customers and other customers it won't suit. So I guess you've just got to filter out what works for you and, and, and do it that way. Yeah, I think that saying's only right until the customer isn't right. <laughs> no, and, and yeah, and that's it. It just really depends on the customer, you know, at the end of the day, for what their expectations are and what they want. Um, I, I've had a couple of situations where I've gone, all right, the customer isn't right. And one of them is when the customer wants me to do gardening on a yeah. day where I'm only doing mowing. And it's like, okay, I, I'm set up with all the right gear to come in and do your mowing. But you want me to spend an hour doing gardening on top of that, and that's yeah. going to take me away from the, all the mowing jobs that I need to get done that day. Yes, yeah. And it not only just take me away from it, but then I've got to collect your green waste when I'm doing your gardening job. 
So, yes. no, I can't do it. I'll come back next week. I'm going to charge you five times as much, but that's what's going to happen. It's going to work for me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so do you find that's a good a good option is to allocate, I guess, time for, say, Monday to Wednesday for, for mowing and then, you know, a couple of days of gardening and, and sort of work here runs around that? Is that an option? So that that's one way of dealing with it. And typically that means the customer's going to pay a little bit more because they specifically want you to do that. You're going to allocate a different day to do it. The alternative way that works well is to allocate the customer the last job of the day. Yes, yeah. So if you're doing their job as the last job of the day, you can afford to go, okay, I'm going to do a green run on the way out. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. And that, that can work. But I've, I've had a customer, and I've mentioned this customer numerous times on the podcast because it's a good reference point for this sort of stuff, where they mm. were just really demanding in terms of when I turned up. They wanted me to call beforehand every time and check that it was okay. And if it wasn't okay, then guess what? Didn't, couldn't do it. And so yeah, I, yeah. I found that customer was so demanding that it wrecked my mowing schedule if I tried to adhere to their request. So I was just yeah. like, no. I can only do it 8 a.m. on a Wednesday. I think it was a Wednesday. Yeah. Um, if that doesn't work for you, then too bad. And I ended up telling that customer, I cannot service you anymore. You're going to need to find somebody yeah. else. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, you get some customers that are like, oh, yeah, can you come around this time, blah, blah, blah. So, oh, well, I've got, you know, I'm I'm not just sitting around waiting. <laughs> I do have plenty of other customers that got to kind of route around you. So, I mean, look, sometimes that's just education, but, you know, I guess it's just a lack of understanding too in, in yeah, general. But, but, you know, some customers can be very challenging and, and they put all those things out there and yeah. it doesn't work in your business. You know, you don't have to say yes. But I guess... Sometimes we find ourselves that we think that we have to say yes, but we don't, you know? Yeah. Well, that customer was always willing to pay a premium too, so it was really tempting to try and make it work. But yeah. you, you have to think about it, right? If it's typically an $80 customer and they're saying, oh, I'll make it $160, it's like, oh, yeah, I'll bend over backwards for you. But then that $160 is only two $80 jobs and they end up ruining half a day. <laughs> yes. I guess that's my point before as well. It's like, you, you know, you can do those extra jobs, but are they actually really beneficial? Like I know I've got some jobs that, yeah, they, they feel like good money. Yeah. But it's like how, but also are they limiting you of making more money, um, yeah. you know, or minimizing you having to take the extra green waste or, you know, in some other area. So, and particularly if you've got demanding customers, you know, that that you will get yeah. certain customers that, that irritate you a bit and you just feel yuck going there, you know. Well, at, at the end of the day, if they're affecting your other customers and yeah. your reliability with your other customers, then that's not going to work. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's, yeah I, know there's, I know there's definitely in past, like when I first started, you just felt like you had to take on anything, you had to, you know, you yep. had to cater to all their needs, but you soon realise, like, if that doesn't work, well, you, you, you're the business owner at the end of the day and you can make that decision to move on. And, look, there's not a big drama. There's always a new job out there. and um. I, I just found when I made those decisions about customers that weren't working out, or well, they didn't feel like I was valued, or they didn't really value the work, or they didn't pay on time. Like when I got rid of them, it just was the best feeling I've ever had, <laughs> just to be able to get a new customer yeah. and not have to worry about it anymore. Because you used to find yourself the day before just going, "Oh, what's the what's the issue going to be today?" Or you know, and it's not a good way when that's what you got to do on a daily basis. I think if your schedule's not full. You've got a little yeah. bit of wiggle room to work with a challenging customer. But if you're getting close to a full schedule, then you've really yeah. got to set the expectations more solidly yourself and say, no, you know what, that's not going to work for me. Yeah. And and like you said, sometimes it's not a, an issue of what the job's worth. It's just how does it make you feel and, do, you know, are you enjoying it as well? And that's probably one of the more important things because you're feeling like yeah. crap every time you go there or you think, oh, what drama's going to happen this week? It's just not very good for you. Yeah, for your mental health or just, you know, generally enjoying your job. Yeah, and you, you can gauge whether a customer is worthwhile in several different ways as to whether you feel good about turning up, you're happy turning up there, Yeah, which is one of my favourite ways of assessing it. Am I happy? Do I need to charge more? Or mm. if they bring out um, jam and scones, does it yeah, make it better? It. <laughs> yeah, and, and look, and sometimes some of those customers that you're not making as much money on, they just make you feel great and you do that job, you know, because because they're great customers and you feel like you're appreciated. So it does go a long way when customers appreciate you, that's for sure. Yeah, as long as it's not by hitting on you. 
Oh, that's it. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> that that happens though. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't think I've had that yet. I've had some interesting experiences, but I haven't had that yet. <laughs> yeah. But I, you hear a lot of stories on LMCA about it. And I've had um, I had one message from somebody saying, do you mow lawns? I'm like, yeah. Can you come around and quote my property? I'm like, yeah, I yeah. can. And do you do extra jobs? I'm like, yeah. Are you, are you the guy that does the, uh, how, how did she put it? Does the extra services? And I'm like, oh, hang on, I think you've got the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> oh, classic. <glossy. laughs> I showed, showed like, my wife that message Leroy, straight away. Leroy services, is it? <laughs> <laughs> After hours services. <laughs> yeah, yeah, classic. <laughs> yeah. So it, it does happen, but yeah, that's not that's not the kind of enjoying the job that I'm after. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you've you've been in business for about two years now. How long did it take you to fill your books up? I'm guessing with gyms, you sort of went from nothing to busy very quickly. Yeah. Yeah, it was pretty quick. I mean, I I probably got to, I think, 50 regulars in the first part of the season. The biggest yeah. challenge I had the first year was that we just had so much rain that it was hard to cater to what I currently had and then take on more leads. I just didn't have the time because you were constantly yeah. in a place of catching up. Um, but, I mean, Probably now I'm at about 60 regulars, which doesn't seem like a huge amount, but I've got some jobs, uh, you know, sort of bigger jobs in amongst that as well. Yeah. My, my goal is probably to get to around about 80 clients. Um, just so, just so when you get to winter, I guess when things potentially harbour in that time, you know, you've got a good bulk of customers still for, for decent cash flow and then you're just doing your extra jobs. Yeah. Um, as I said, even even this last winter, it was really really good compared to the previous year. I've got a heap of different jobs and pretty much went through, had the similar cash flow to the summer period. So that's good. Um, yeah, it was yeah. super good. And I haven't and seen well, it. I haven't seen anyone saying it lately. But you see on LMCA on a semi regular basis, how many customers do you have, and how many do you want to have? And I think that's that's the wrong way of assessing your business potential because mm. if you've got say 60 customers at the moment and your mm. business schedule is flat out then you don't need 80 customers and I'm not saying you shouldn't aim for 80 customers but yeah. with with 60 customers of the right size customers then that's great yeah. you could have yeah. 10 customers and be busy or you could have 150 customers and not be busy yeah definitely definitely comes down to I guess the value of each customer and and you know what what's they've entailed in each job because I've got a couple of jobs where you you know you're there for several hours and it's good money and you've got other ones where you're just in and out so um it yeah definitely it definitely is is some, yeah, yeah. I've, I've always had a range of customers and I don't now I've only got one customer but I've always through most of the business I've had a range of customers that were anywhere from 15 minutes through to half a day at a time yeah or 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 a full day at a time yeah yeah yeah, and that's the thing, definitely. I mean, for me, I, 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 I don't mind the in and out work, like getting in and just punching in a lawn and I, I feel like that's, that's quite good. And then other times it's good to have a bit of a mix too where you're doing a, a job for half a day or you're doing several day, several hours at a job. You know, it yeah. is good to have a bit of a mix. But, I mean, I even find with like 60 customers when you're at peak time, even the, the overflow of work that come from those customers will keep you super busy. So, yeah. Kind of, I, I guess the biggest thing for me is just trying to work out with those customers to try to bring that work into the winter period, um, and then getting a good amount of extra customers that I need, so that you know when it halves, that I can just pretty much cruise through winter and not be so. Yeah. Because I guess everybody gets to winter time and they're probably a little bit anxious, like I was, and I am probably each season, because you sort of think, oh, is this going to drop off? And um, you know, especially with my cash flow situation before, I was like, "Oh, this is I need to make this base level of income each week." So, um, but definitely want to take that out of the equation in future. I've recently been running the Ego Select Cut Fifty Two Centimeter Mower. It's available in a contractor's kit specifically for those of us running them all day. Two ten amp hour batteries and the turbocharger are all included in the contractor kit, bringing it in at seventeen ninety nine. 
When mowing maintained lawns, you'll never run out of battery power as it recharges the 10 amp battery in 60 minutes. If you don't have access to charging while you work, you'll get through an average 8-hour residential day with 4 to 5 10 amp hour batteries. This will vary significantly depending on the type of grass and frequency of cut. As you well know, there are many variables on residential jobs that affect the amount of time you spend mowing and how much load you put on the mower. This is the first battery-powered mower I've used that is a serious alternative to petrol-powered push- or self-propelled 21-inch mowers. While there are now several options in this space, Ego meets amazing value, and I'd rate it well above the consumer grade. In fact, I think it fills the prosumer niche in this category perfectly. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's an interesting one, isn't it, to look at how many customers you need to get to keep you busy. And when it comes to winter, like you say, you always a little bit anxious about making sure you get enough customers to get you through. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I got um, I was speaking to a, another gym's bloke and he pretty much predominantly runs, um, does standard work. He's got a 32 Gravely and he you know, right. runs a mulch kit, a dedicated mulch kit, and he's got 125 regulars yeah. and just does that, does that solo. And so, wow. you know, that's a pretty solid effort, I'd, I'd assume, but he's, he's pretty much worked his business to that. You know, that direction where he's doing ninety five percent of of standard work, and the rest is he's got a um he's got the blank mower, the raisin too, just oh, yeah. for his basic kind of stuff that he does. You know, the few lawns that he has left to do with um, push mowing. So, and yep. he's pretty much trying to get to the point where he's one hundred percent just doing standard work. And I, I definitely get that model because I, I you know you you do find there's a huge relief at the end of the day. You know, using yeah. a standard all day as opposed to doing the push mowing because the push mowing definitely takes it out of you. That's for sure. <laughs> You know, doing all those Ks each week. Yeah. Well, I think that can be a good business model if you build customers up that uh, predominantly allow you to do small jobs, that, but they're big enough properties that you can put the standard on them, then yeah. you can make your run much more efficient than if you've got to do slightly larger jobs, but you can only get a 21-inch mower on it. No, that's it. Yeah, definitely. But yeah, it's, I guess... When the season allows it, it's great to be able to build your business in a specific direction like that and build a niche type of customer that works really well for your business. Yeah, and it certainly takes time. It's one of those things that is just going to take a few seasons to, or several seasons to get that efficiency. I think that's the hardest thing when you first start is you, you are. You're just kind of taking on whatever sort of work you can get yeah. and then you're trying to establish you know, what kind of work you want to do, what kind of work you enjoy. And then you know, try and I guess get a focus and direct direction to where you want to push the business in future and and you know be you know more profitable and, and more efficient yeah. and also enjoy what you're doing more as well. Yeah. Well, Mark Ladaway is one of the people I've interviewed that really has built a strong business model around doing that, doing predominantly stratas or body corporates that are 15, yep. 20 yep. minute jobs. Yeah, Mark's always got plenty of data on LMCA. He's, he does <laughs> he does some good stuff. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not sure about his whip, whip dipping of the hedges sometimes, but <laughs> is that the same guy? I think that might be the case. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Mark, but, Mark's cool. I like Mark. He's got some good data. He's always putting up his his efficiencies and different things. with His walker. Yeah, he he doesn't mind ruffling feathers too. He's quite you know, <laughs> yeah. quite passionate about what he knows is true. Yeah, I like that. He, he takes it on the chin though. He doesn't really seem to phase him on on the on the yeah. group at all. Yeah, it was good to meet him up at the um, show too. All right, he was up there. Okay, cool. Yeah, he was he was there on BJ's event. So it was great. Yeah, yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah, but I reckon Mark Ladaway would be similar in some ways. I'm oh, sorry, Mark Ladaway. Paul Luck would be very similar to oh, Mark yeah. Ladaway. Yeah. 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 I reckon it would yes, be, yes. It'd be kind of interesting focused, to yeah. get Paul into my podcast dungeon. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be good. I, look, I hope I hope that Paul, even if he is listening, you know, wasn't offended by that because I actually thought, <laughs> you know, I actually agree with his perspective. You know, it was it was more like, I think if you look at it on face value and you think, oh, well, that's not really possible. It, it's not really so much about that. It's 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 about saying, okay, you can run a more efficient business with less outlay yeah. and make more profit versus a bigger business. And then have all have have lots of machinery, lots of overheads, you know. And then the the added drama that goes with that. So it's like, yeah, I, I got I got his perspective. So 
when I tagged yeah. the boys and and I thought I thought the 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 podcast is, was pretty fair. They seem yeah. pretty fair, but you know I hope I hope Paul wasn't offended because you know I thought his perspective was was definitely um, something to be considered. I I don't think he would have been offended at all. And yeah, um, you know I I think like Mark Ladderway, I think he'd have plenty to say if I could get him in the dungeon. Yeah, yeah, would I would like to see that definitely. He'd be he'd good to get on for sure. One of the one of the podcasts yeah. for sure. Well, I've I've tried to reach out to him, but I think I might need to publicly reach out to him and make sure <laughs> that he sees it in LMCA. Got him right now, Paul. We're, we're reaching out to you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that'd be good, wouldn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And it's good to get everybody's different perspective because you know everybody looks at different business models through their own through their own I guess previous experience of what they think's right and whatever else. So yeah, everybody's got a different perspective, and there's there's something to learn from everybody. That's for sure. Yeah, and I think even when somebody isn't holding a popular opinion, mm. you can still learn from them. There's plenty of people who you might look at the guy you mentioned who was going out of business, Chris Neal. Yeah, yeah, Chris Neal, yeah. There's plenty of good things you can learn about running a business from what he has done, whether it's what he's done successfully or what he failed yeah. in. Whatever yeah. it is, like the out of the 100 and I think I've done 111 episodes that I've published as of today, and there's something that people can learn from every interview. Yeah, and the one the one thing that I loved about about the story with Chris is yes, it was sad with with his business and what he sort of had to decide to shut down, but everybody was super encouraging. Yeah. Um, you know, even on his last post, they were like, don't give up, man. Like, you know, yeah. And I think there was such a supportive community there that really wanted to help him. So yeah, you know, it's a similar story with him. Like it'd be great to see him come back and learn from, from what he's been through and, and, you know, cause it seemed like he was actually really enjoying what he was doing, but, yeah, you know, he probably just needed to modify some things in his business and and get some good advice. And there were so many people reaching out to him. So you know, I'd, I'd love to see him back involved in the industry and and doing well. It'd be a great story. Yeah, there's been a number of people that have closed their business publicly on LMCA, made a post about mm. it, and shared what's going on. And I yeah. think it takes a lot of courage to do that. But it does, I think definitely. Ho- overwhelmingly, the group has been really supportive and helpful yeah. for people that are struggling and helping people to reassess their business, reassess decisions yeah. they've made and reassess pricing or knowing their numbers so that they can run a successful business. So it's not very often where you see a post on LMCA where you go, the negativity is so hard to get through yeah. that there's nothing positive in there. Definitely. Yeah. I, overall, definitely. It's all, it's majority positive, positive stuff. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And everybody seems super supportive. And I think, Again, BJ's event was just a really good um, example of that. Like it was such yep. a buzz and I think everybody was super excited and I was like, I felt like I was meeting all these people that I'd seen online and, and it, yep. it was just a really good feeling, you know, being involved yep. in it and seeing other crew there. So, yeah, super yeah. exciting. I would have loved to go on there and just been a fly on the wall. It was, uh, it was kind of hard to absorb everything because I was that busy meeting people and rushing around. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, well, I, well, I, I didn't get to meet. I didn't get to meet Benny in the end. I was he was sort of chatting to some guys at the end. So yeah, he was probably getting smashed all day. And I met. I just shook, shook BJ's hand. And I think you got him away for an interview while I was chatting. <laughs> while I was chatting to another gym's bloke there. So <laughs> yep, so yeah, I plan to plan to have a chat to him at some point again. Definitely love what they do. They're awesome guys. They are. They're very very down to earth and um, yeah. passionate about sharing what they know. Yeah, no, that's it, and and you know, I I love I love Benny's out, out there opinions at times, and, <laughs> and just their, their comedy. You know, it, it is it's great fun. They really work off each other really well, and that's part of the yeah you know, enjoyment of listening to what they do. And yep, and they're doing a lot for the industry, so it's yeah, it's great. Like yourself as well, Gary. Obviously, I, I have some good chats with Ben and BJ offline, and um, Ben Ben will call me occasionally and be like, "Oh, what do you think about this?" And I'm like. You know what, Ben? I just can't agree with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's it. Hey, it was funny because I, I think Ben gave me a little, a little bit of hate on the because I talked about the Dave Ramsey um, quote around the guy with the banged up trucks making more profit than the guy with the flash truck. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was something where you say, "Oh, who the f would think that?" Rah, rah, rah. <laughs> and so you know, again, it's like. Hey, don't just take it as is, mate. It's it's like yeah. just understand the concept, you know. Um, 
Yeah, that's funny. exactly right. I love how he speaks, what he, what's on his mind, and um, yeah, it's yeah. always very funny. Yeah, and even if I don't agree with Ben, he's always got something that's worthwhile to listen to. Yeah, yeah, and definitely. There's, there's not a lot that I don't agree with him on, but uh, there's the odd occasion where it's like, no, Ben, you know what? Catching isn't the only way to do things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. yeah, that's it. I mean, I guess everybody's going to have different perspectives. Yeah, for yeah, sure. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, great guys. Love what they're doing. Yeah, no, they're awesome. Oh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see um, what next year's events look like. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think based on what was there, man, if you can build on that, it's going to be phenomenal events. Like I think looking at what BJ put up about you know putting some different crew, you know, different people at the, even the service mate crew and the couple of softwares. I know that you you spoke to a guy recently about that. I listened to that podcast this morning about service mate and. And the software side of it, and um, yeah, that's yeah. been something I've been trialing out for the last sort of few weeks, looking at different options with that too. So, yeah, well, there's a bunch of different CRMs or um, scheduling software options available now. Yeah, and um, I I like ServiceMate because they're Australian based, but yeah. um, they're not going to work for everybody. And yeah, yeah. It'd be nice if they did, but there are good options out there to choose too. So it's not like you need one package that works for everybody. Yeah, no, that's it. And then definitely, um, you know, every program is suited to, to, to different sort of stages of business. I know I trialed three recently. I trialed, um, yeah, ServiceMate, Tradeify, and Sortscape. Oh, yeah. Um, all, all three of them are based in Australia. Um, I think I think the Tradeify may be Kiwi based, but they do have a head, a head office in, in Sydney because they're all Kiwis. So you, the, <laughs> or they, yep. they call you. Yep. Um, but yeah, interesting because each each um, each app definitely has different um, focuses, and I know ServiceMate was man, some of the features were pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, but you could see that working very well for you know, I mean, you could use it as a solo operator, but you could see it being geared towards a person that was running a fairly good sized team. Yep. Where something like Sortscape was probably more a sole trader um, sort of focus, a couple of staff. And then Trader Four was kind of a good in, intermediate between the two. I felt like okay. there was some good things yeah. on that too. So that was an interesting one to um, to look at. I mean, I previously yeah. used to do systems um, system analysis as part of the IT role previously. So I used yeah, okay. a lot of different applications and trial things. And yeah, so that was something that interests me. So um, question for you on that, because you with your IT background, that would make a lot of sense to hear your perspective. Yeah. In order to do a proper trial of those software packages yeah did you two two things did you try it for more than a couple of weeks and did you get somebody professional to help you set it up i i didn't i did service service mate has a pretty awesome tutorial set up so yes. they can go step by step through each stage yep. so you can learn the very basics to quite complex stuff but i know yep. also they focus, you know, you can get consultants, certified consultants that will set it up for you as your business, as you spoke about in the podcast as well. Um, Tradeify was fairly straightforward too. Like I, one of the things that I always looked at when I was sort of doing that was like, well, how are people going to engage with it? How can I just set it up myself and can it be pretty easy to set up uh, or pretty intuitive? Or is it so complex and need somebody else to kind of get involved? I think I think if you get real granular with service, mate, you know, you probably would want to get somebody else in. But yeah. I think in general with lawn care, like you, you could you definitely set it up by yourself. Um, yeah, okay. Whereas uh, Sortscape is super easy. Um, you know, again, fairly basic features in comparison to service, mate. But, yeah, you know, okay. for, again, for a, for a solo operator with a few staff, I think that's really suitable. Yeah, um, but yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing I look for is just you. You want to make sure it's something you feel comfortable with, yep. and if it's overwhelming for yourself or your staff, um, that's the real challenge of engaging and, and making it successful. Because sometimes you yeah. can go out and spend all this money, and then find that it doesn't really work or suit what you're doing. So, so yeah, yeah. it's definitely something I think you should trial. I mean, you even mentioned. Um, I think you mentioned on the service mate one you can do a, a dollar a month light um, thing yes. and just really get involved with it because sometimes the two week trials come around so quick and you don't really have that time to get into it. Yep. And I sort of think it's almost like you said worth 
purchasing it for a few months and just trialing a few different ones and, and really getting your head around it and testing it in the field and then saying, okay, I've tested these three. Yeah. This one definitely works, you know, and just working out based on pros and cons how it's going to work for your business. Well, I know and if mate, I go... And- if I go down to the service station tomorrow and I fill up my fuel drums, I'm going to be close to two hundred dollars in fuel. Yeah. If I was to take service mate for thirty dollars a month, I think it's twenty nine ninety five a month, and at the moment you can get it for twenty dollars a month. So for twenty dollars a month, that is ten months worth of trial for the same as what it cost me to fill up my fuel drums for the lawnmower. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and it's such a good investment. Like, I mean, we we use Jim's jobs with Jim's, and it's yeah. it, it honestly it's a it's a great system. Unfortunately, for some people and for me included, I get a little bit frustrated because you get bugs every occasion and, and it's <laughs> a bit slow at times. But yeah. the system itself is actually really easy and user friendly. And I've I've even said to Jim, I've even emailed Jim directly and said, "Look, this is a great product." Yeah. I've tried to lead all these other programs and this is a really good, simple to use product and it could be something that you could sell to independents and, you yeah. know, people could use because um, what I found between um, Jim's jobs compared to the other ones is that you could you can basically administrate everything through the through your phone, through your app, whereas I guess with the bigger ones like ServiceMate or Tradify, you've kind of got to go through the admin dashboard on your computer yeah. to get the proper admin access. I've um, noticed that with service, mate. You... Yeah, I think that's a bit of a downfall. And I, and I think one of the other things that I really like about Jim's jobs, I mean, obviously that's only available to us or some yeah. crew, with, um, I think some crew at Visa are trialing it as well. I think they're just okay. doing a bit of a test. Um, is they have a revenue um, a revenue sort of tracker for each week. Okay. So you can simply see your upcoming revenue. Um, and that's yeah. probably one thing I think on a dashboard within um, – you know, the other programs is they're just sort of a bit behind in that aspect because yeah, for okay. me, I look, I look at my next week and I can see my blank, you know, I can see the days where I haven't got work and I can easily slot a job in there. Yeah. Whereas, you know, you know when, you, when you go on an admin dashboard, you got to manually go in, you know, next week, next day, click through to find the blanks. So um, that's one thing that definitely um, they need to sort of consider having like a widget with revenue forecasting or something like that because that's super helpful for me. Yeah. Definitely would be helpful. Yeah, well, I think you know the hard thing is that you you run blind. Like I, you you sort of unless you're going through and manually manually checking it. The, the other the other thing that I was sort of saying that I didn't get to was if I I can get the lead in, I can put it into the system, I can do a quote in the spot, and then I can put the scheduled job in my phone and it's set up for the next fortnightly run. You know, so yeah, I don't have to go home at night time and then go to the dashboard on the web web browser and do it via there. I can do it on the job. So it saves me having to go home and do it. And that's probably where I found, oh, I'm not quite sure if I want to jump yet because, you know, I do like the benefits of, of what I'm using currently. So apart from a few bugs every now and again, which frustrate me, but anyway. So I, I haven't um, tried doing that with ServiceMate yet, but if I understand correctly, you should be able to set it up on your dashboard on the computer so that you can do all of that from your phone. So you can do the quote from your phone and then upgrade it to yes. a job. You definitely can. Um, I think the the main thing is that you, if you wanted to do like reoccurring jobs like scheduling, yeah, I think you're pretty sure you have to do that through the admin panel. Um, and then okay. the reporting features are more like you go into a reporting section and you get a revenue for, or, or you get a more basic reporting through there. So yeah, okay. I know that I know that one of the ones I looked at that um, what's the gentleman in the the states, the young young guy. Um, oh. um I think I know who you mean. He's he at just... gyms recently. What's his name? He's the young, fit, fit little guy, and he's a bit of a pocket rocket fella. He's got um, Augusta Lawn Care. That's him, yeah. Yeah, the gentleman from there. He's running one called Copilot. Um, yeah, and it's that's pretty expensive software, but he's got a lot of um, dashboard widgets of you know revenue forecasting and different sort of things that are really interesting. So, yeah, I mean, if you're a business owner, that's you definitely want to keep on tabs of all that for sure and see you know what you've got coming up and and how things are going. Yeah, I've been interested in that one coming from Augusta Lawn Care to see what it would be like. So 
Yeah. It sounds, yeah, it sounds know, like it's pretty powerful, just um, not very affordable for people. Yeah, it was pretty expensive. Eh? Like I, I had a browser and it was like $150 American like a month or something like that, you know, compared, yeah. to, compared to the other ones that we, you know, that we just mentioned before. So. so it's probably suited to people who are running multiple teams rather than somebody who's just running solo. Yeah, it definitely would be. Yeah, yeah, definitely running model. And it seems like that's more so the model in the States where a lot of, you know, a lot of us over here are solo, um, you know, solo owners rather than over yeah. there. They've got a lot of workers doing that kind of work. So, yeah, but, I think yeah. there's there's a fair bit of a mix in the States, but you tend to hear from the guys who are focused on running teams. Yeah, yeah. Running a team. I think that's, I think that's a big thing too with choosing software. It just really comes down to, you know what size you want to grow to and and you know i guess focusing at what what stage you are in your business because yeah. you know you might start with a sort scope and that works great for your business and then you might grow it to 10 or 15 people and you go like, okay i probably need something with a bit more power and a bit more yeah. functionality so yeah. you know as your business grows obviously you've got to adapt to it and, and work it yeah and that's one of the things I've wondered. If you start with Sortscape or Henry or something like that and then you grow your business, you get to that point where you go, I actually have to change software packages. I think that's a frustration that you have to deal with if you're growing to the yeah. point that you have to change because a lot of those software packages become so entrenched in your business that it's quite yeah. painful to unplug from one and plug into another. It is, and it's so. It's when when you get used to a system and it becomes second nature, it is so hard to jump out, you know, and and learn all over again and and have that discomfort because, you know, there's going to be an uptake where people have to learn how to do it, and your admin has to learn how to do it, and and your yeah. staff need to learn how to clock in and clock out and download the app and all that stuff, you know. And as I said, it's got to be intuitive because if it's too complex and not intuitive for your staff, like there's going to be no engagement, you know, when you put that into your business. So you really need to consider what is the right um, software for your business, you know, to get Definitely. the most out of it. Otherwise, it can be a very expensive process to then transfer back to another program or back to your old one. And um, yeah. you found your place all that time and, and, and money. And I think that, that makes a lot of difference for people who are unsure if they want to go from being solo to running multiple employees. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's right, yeah. You see a lot of people tend to be fairly certain about what they want to do. I only want to be solo. I want it to be lifestyle so that I can relax and choose my own hours. And yeah. other people are like, well, I wanted to be solo, but now I'm busy. I want to put on an employee. Yeah, or, yeah. Or I want to set up a team so that I can be off the tools. Yeah, yeah, even if you, even if you like, you know, just doing quotes and sort of managing the back end of it and, and managing your team. I mean, definitely in that scenario where you're doing that, I think ServiceMate is is a really good tool because yeah, essentially the communication features between you know routing or putting job cards to certain team members and and notifying them and routing them and all sorts of stuff. Man, it's some pretty flash yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Yeah, it's very powerful. But, uh, I guess that's a big thing for me too is like where, where to next, you know, do I get to the stage where I, I put on somebody? And I think the biggest thing for me right now is like, okay, if if I'm struggling currently financially with cash flow issues, I need to get that sorted first yeah. before I take on another employee and then I can't pay myself and I've got to pay them first. So, um, yep. so sometimes I guess the mentality is, oh, just get more work, <laughs> you know, <laughs> get more work, get an employee, and then that just becomes a bigger issue. So. Yeah, you know, again, that's so important to um, you know, if you're running a business where you've got plenty of work and you're not feeling that, you know, that's probably good. At, but at some point, you know, that that might sort of topple down unless you've got those good systems in place. Because if you've got problems before you've got an employee, you're definitely going to have more problems unless you manage it effectively. Yeah, you know, making on multiple employees because there's so much more to consider. Yes. I think going going back to what you were saying just before, like if you're struggling to have enough work to get through winter, yeah, and you're trying to juggle the balance between having enough work in winter and being too busy in summer, then that's going to multiply that problem when you have employees, unless you have a solution to that beforehand. Uh, yeah, totally. And, and look, I can I can very easily understand from my perspective. Yeah, you know, solo operators just simple. Like you've only got yourself to worry about. You know, and I also understand from people who want to employ people. Like I think BJ's scenario is a great one. Yeah, he's got he's, he's got you know multiple employees, and he's got those um 
places to look after the strata sort of stuff, body corp stuff. Yep. And he's actually got a really good business model that that works great for. And um, yeah. And um, you know, the challenge is is that you do have, you are responsible for keeping those guys busy, and you know, there is definitely yep. other the other side that comes with that as well. And um, yeah, yeah, but I think he's he's got some good sort of things in place, having that consistency with those um properties and. And I think he was sort of saying that he just focuses on the acreage work and doing stuff that he enjoys. So it's a great fit yeah. for him. And yeah, and it's um yeah, great business for him for sure. Yeah. I think in order to get over that hurdle, you want to get over that hurdle we were talking about before of cash flow. Yeah. Because if you can have consistent cash flow, then that makes it a lot easier for you to be able to pay an employee. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I think that our industry in general is is quite up and down. Like we're weather based. You know, everything's yeah. dependent on weather. Do we get enough rain? Have we got have we got too much rain? <laughs> you know, is it sunny? Is it raining? Um, yeah, it is a bit of a challenge one because our cash flow can be quite disruptive. Although when it's good, it's good. And then you know, if you go through a drought, well, things can get quite challenging. Obviously, so. I think that's where what BJ's doing, where you've got a lot of body corporates or, yeah. or large stratas, commercial contracts that give you that consistent income yeah. and helps make it easy to have consistent cash flow as well. So it's pretty yeah, easy to sure. put on an employee if you have a decent amount of work that is all consistent yeah. regardless of the season. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Yeah, it's a, it's definitely a good business model and you've got yeah got that peace of mind that, you know, you've, that works there. You know, obviously it gets renewed every now and again, but um, yeah. rather than being subject to all the weather and all the other things that could, could happen, you know, it's definitely a good way to go about it. For sure, definitely. Okay, well, I think we've covered an hour and 20 minutes with you. We've covered a lot of where you've a come of- from. <laughs> <laughs> what what your ambitions are, um, and sounds like still working that out in terms of whether you want to stay solo or maybe some stage put on an employee. Um, yeah. As well yeah. as a good section on software. <laughs> yes, that's it, yeah. Yeah, so and- I think... I think for me, it's probably just working out, you know, what direction I want to go and just filtering out the work I don't enjoy and, and um, just being a bit more focused on what I what I want to achieve with the business and, yeah, you know, find the customers that suit that, you know. Um, I think one of the things that, that Dan said was like, you know, once you decide what you want, everything else follows, you know. It just, it all takes place as soon as you decide. If that's the direction you want to go, everything kind of goes that way. It just, you've got to make that decision, you know, and, and, and let it take time to work it, work itself out. Yeah, that's um, pretty good advice. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's good like that. He's um, very helpful. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I think it's been uh, it's been a good little chat with you, good interview. Awesome, mate. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. I appreciate getting you in the dungeon. It's uh, always <laughs> fun to get, get a new virgin. Thank you for listening to Aussie Lawn Stars. Please remember to rate and review the show on the Apple Podcasts app or the player you use. Exciting new shows are released every Monday. Make sure you follow or subscribe to hear the next episode.